So <clears throat> today we're going to have uh, I'll start off with a little couple of simple demonstrations of the triple electric effect, and um, also the relationship between the two different kinds of charges that we've talked about. Um, so we'll start here with this, what's called an electroscope. It's discussed in the text. It's two pieces of metal, um, this uh, metal yoke, and then a bar that's connected to it, swings freely inside here, like this. And uh, this is uh, connected through to this uh, piece of metal here. This outer frame is not in, uh, uh, it's in contact, but it's uh, only in contact through these plastic pieces here. Uh, and we'll discover that plastic, of course, insulates, doesn't conduct electricity very well. So the metal connection is between this and these two pieces. All of these are uh, in contact with each other. And uh, so now I have a piece of uh, <clears throat> PVC here, uh, which I'm going to rub. Here's the shot. It's a nice dry day. You're going to hear all kinds of sparks going on up here. Uh, usually in the south, especially in the summer, this is hard to do. <laughs> Humidity messes it up. So I'm going to rub this PVC plate with a paper towel, and then I'm going to put this metal uh, in contact with it here. You might have heard the spark. Mr. Miller's close enough. Maybe you can hear some of these things as well as I can. And this is a plastic handle, so it's a metal piece right here. And uh, I'm going to touch it there. Okay, and you could hear the spark, I think, when, when I touched it. Uh, and uh, now you can tell that something has changed in this. Uh, it's now repelling itself in a way, so that the, the parts here are now pushing against each other. So there's a force between this. Uh, flex of uh, the swinging rod and this fixed piece of metal. And so it causes a torque on the thing and uh, now balances the torque of gravity, um, the, the torque that's present there. Um, so it holds it in place like that. Now, uh, here's another one, uh, acrylic. And I'm going to do the same thing using, again, paper towel. And you can even hear it. Miller might be able to, it's sparking even when I rub it with a towel. Okay, and um, it's undoing, and it's, I haven't even touched it yet, but but I'm going to go ahead and touch it here. That spark, it sparked, it already discharged again. And uh, I can, okay, so let's see. Now the problem is I may have actually charged it the opposite here. It's hard to control these things. So let me assume that, that that's what's happened. I'm going to try to bring up a, this piece in contact with it here. Get close. Okay. But it's undoing the effect. All right. It continues to undo it. And then there's a spark. Did you hear the spark? And now it's something has happened. Okay. And now it's back to repelling itself again. Okay, so if you do these things carefully, you can find that they're actually two different kinds of charge and that they seem to counter each other, uh, which we summarize by, uh, in an interiometric way by assigning it positive and negative. Um, but something is happening, obviously, the, the flowing is, flow is going on here. And notice also <coughs> that I don't actually have to touch it. I just need to get it close, and it's inducing some kind of change. Um, and, and it, but it's recoverable. If I take it away, then it goes back to the way it was. But if I actually get it close enough to hear the uh, spark, the discharge, the spark, then something permanent has happened. And now when I take this away, that is changed in some permanent way. So if you do these carefully enough, you can find evidence that it's a consistent explanation with having two different types of charge. And when this is charged with one of those charges, it repels itself. So it has apparently some charge distributed on here and charge distributed on there, and that's repelling itself. So the like charges repel. And then I can counter that by taking something of the opposite uh, of a different kind of charge, the other kind of charge, bringing it close to there, and I can actually neutralize that. I'm careful about it. But of course, what happens also is it tends to over-neutralize 
put more than a neutral amount of charge on there. So it becomes also stays repelling, but now I've got a different type of charge. Um, and of course, this, this triple electric effect is, uh, uh, is easy enough to make. <clears throat> it's easy enough to do. It is a little diff difficult to control, is the problem. As I mentioned, uh, in the south during the summer, this happens a lot, um, um, where the humidity will undo a lot of these effects. makes it difficult to control. Here's another one. I'm going to take a piece of plastic, rub it with some fur, and then it will uh, attract the, the pieces of paper here. Nice dry day. <laughs> and of course, everybody, I think, is familiar with, well, there's some hair on here. <laughs> Not mine. Um, <clears throat> everybody's familiar with uh, getting, you know, accidentally discharging yourself on something, getting yourself charged up, and then touching something it can be kind of painful. Um, and of course, the really dry weather, cold, dry weather, makes that uh, really obvious when that happens. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, let's go back here to. I want to do two things here. Hang on a second. I want to turn off. Okay, back to this. I'll put these aside. <clears throat> so he goes through the discussion in, in the text about the discovery of um, these kinds of forces, uh, these kind of electrostatic forces or, or electric forces that you can get, uh, where you're discovering that these substances, substances have the ability, massive substances have the ability uh, be given a charge and hold it, which then has an effect on other things that also have charge. So either repulsive or attractive forces that can be set up. Now he uh, notes that the dis these discoveries, uh, first quantitatively accurately measured by Coulomb, when did that happen? When did Coulomb discover what is called Coulomb's law? Anybody remember the date? Late 1700s. Yeah, about a hundred years after Newton's development of the inferiometric, where he is able to describe planetary motion in the presence of a gravitational field generated by the bodies. Um, so why so long? Why did it take so long? I mean, a lot of these effects were known in some way. Uh, electric and magnetic uh, forces were known. But it took a hundred years before people started becoming very precise in making careful measurements. So Coulomb's law uh, relates the force between two charged massive bodies, uh, analogous to Newton's universal law of gravity. Why so long? Any thoughts about that? And I guess even another question. Let's actually let's let's put a question before that. Why did locomotion, the study of locomotion, come first? Why did Newton's imperiometric theory deal with locomotion and gravity first and not electricity and magnetism. Yeah, Mr. Don. We don't, um, especially back then, for electricity and magnetism, they didn't directly observe it as much in their everyday lives. And also, humans have like, looked toward the skies and looked at moving planets for like thousands of years. And just throwing things and yeah. walking around and bumping into stuff, moving things around, those locomotions are very easy to do. Electricity is not hard to to do, but it's hard to control. It's hard to uh, get good control on that, and it changes easily. The amount of charge on a body is affected by the humidity in the room. Uh, a magnet, you can get a magnet that's pretty stable. Um, so there, there's some relationship between magnetic forces, you know, forces on magnets. Um, so that, that may have, uh, magnetism maybe should have been uh, further developed than it was. But as Mr. Dowell points out, locomotion is really the first thing logically to begin with. Because how do we know that an electric field is present? Observe locomotion? Yeah, it makes something move, right? Just like I did with the, with the electroscope and the pieces of paper and stuff. It makes stuff move. 
magnet will make another magnet move as you push it towards the other magnet. Um, you can make it move around. So studying uh, electric and magnetic fields uh, is going to be aided by an understanding of impetus and force and mass. Once you understand those, and once you have an inferiometric theory that uh, is based on careful measurements of the force involved, then that sets the stage understanding for pushing electricity and magnetism, pushing the same understanding of electricity and magnetism. So the electrostatic, the electric force law of Coulomb that says that the force between two bodies goes inversely as the square of the distance is very much like the gravitational force law that Newton envisioned. Uh, but it takes how to prove that experimentally is a bit of a challenge. Also materials are very important, having a control of the materials because uh, um, especially with magnetism, being able to control the magnetism, alter it in some way, um, but also electrically, ha uh, making wires, for example. Uh, it would be very easy to study magnetic induction if you have wires that can be coded. If you don't have that, it's a little harder to study magnetic induction, as we will do in Chapter 4. So Faraday spent a lot of time making coded wiring that he could uh, wrap around it into a coil. Uh, that wasn't really possible to do technologically. Very difficult to make a long wire, flexible wire, that you could coat and then wrap around the coil. That depends on having certain technology. Uh, so the, the logical progression is there. Um, and then once you have the imperiometric theory of locomotion, then you can start, you have the mindset, to start doing the, uh, the corresponding thing in electricity and magnetism. So we find that 100 year gap, maybe also it had to do with just the fact that people weren't used to the ideas that Newton had developed. A lot of people still were trying to figure it out and understand what he had. So it took a while for those ideas to sink in. Uh, but then once the, that progression starts in the late 1700s, then it's very rapid. You see from the late 1700s to about the mid 1800s, less than 100 years, you have a, a absolute revolution in the understanding of electricity and magnetism. Uh, that they're related to each other, uh, and you see that through magnetic induction, for example. Um, and finally then, Maxwell's, Maxwell's codification of the laws of electromagnetism. So Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism is a fully imperiometric theory again, just analogous to um, Newton's, but it, it's actually uh, the part of it that we're studying is just the force law and what generates the fields and how the fields are generated, studying the fields. The fields are much richer than gravitational fields. Um, and so we're able to um, do a lot of interesting demos in class because it'll E&M has a lot of fun things to do in class. You can do a lot of interesting demonstrations with electricity and magnetism. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to start kind of progressively, starting with Coulomb's law, and we'll follow the trend historically, but it's also logical. We start with just inducing charge on a substance, two substances, studying the force law between them. Uh, we also saw something else happen here, and that is when I had the electroscope, I could bring the metal plate, the charged metal plate, close to it. I didn't have to actually touch it or actually get a discharge to occur, and it still altered the uh, electroscope. And so there's something else going on, which has to do with the mobility of the charges charged parts are moving around and it's uh, inducing a, a, the presence of the second charged substance is causing the charges to rearrange. And so that kind of uh, polarization uh, also takes place and that's another thing that we'll have to we'll come to study. Uh, what I don't have in this room is the ability to do uh, simply anyway. But the similar sort of experiment with the uh, pieces of paper I could also do with uh, water, if I got water and drift it, or a nice steady stream flowing down and charge up one of those rods and bring the rod close to the water, the water actually bends, the stream bends over. Uh, and it's always attracted, it always comes close. It doesn't matter which charge I uh, use, whether it's a positive or a negative charge, it will always attract the water. Um, but that's not because of the, that the water has charged, clearly because what we just said it works the same way. It's always attractive whether I bring a positive or a negative charge to it. It's always been, it's always attractive. So it's something that's going on in the water. 
the substance of the water is being altered in some way by the presence of this electric field. So there are a lot of interesting things that are going on here, and you have to be very careful to control them. Uh, mobile charges are making it more difficult. Uh, and, and gravitation, mass doesn't move around, doesn't rearrange itself so easily. Um, it does a little bit like with the tides on the Earth. There's a little bit of rearrangement of the mass, but that's small. Whereas with electrical uh, uh, conductive substances, charge rearranges itself very easily on these bodies. They're mobile. And some materials are more have more mobile carriers. Other materials don't have that uh, mobility. And uh, so that's another aspect of it that makes it challenging to study. Okay, so but we're going to put uh, we're going to build up into this first effect. Let me let me give you an outline for what we're going to be facing here. We're going to study four things in succession. Chapter two. We'll study electrostatics. Uh, chapter three, we'll study magnetostatics. Chapter four, we will study magnetic induction, which shows there's a relationship between magnetic fields and currents in a, in a conductor. And then the last thing is called the, the last quasi-static Approximation, and that takes a little bit more explanation of what that's about. Chapter five, and that allows us to progress and build up to the, to the um, chapter six, where we will do Maxwell's equations. What we are building up in each chapter is some piece of the overall Maxwell's equations. In electrostatics, we want we want to put charges on something, and we don't want the charges to move. So we want Put charges in place, which means that uh, we, we prefer not to deal with conductors if, they're if they allow the charge to flow around. You don't want that to happen, so you don't want things to be moving around. So you want to have uh, a fixed charge, two fixed charges, and study the force between them. And, and that's the first step. The second step with magnetostatics is we'll take the analog, uh, where we now give a charged body. So charge is a sub is a property of the substance of a massive body. We can add to it or take away. We can also give a charged body impetus. And that uh, causes another effect, a magnetic field, to exist around the charged body with impetus. And we find that we can have now uh, forces between two different charged bodies with impetus. In other words, we could have a wire that has charged parts, and the current in the wire is evidence, is the uh, evidence of impetus in the charges. And we can bring two current carrying wires together and find a force between them. And that will be the study of magnetostatics. Again, we don't want the current to change and we don't want the wires moving. So that's the uh, approximation that's uh, studied in chapter three. Again, this is the process of abstraction. Remember, we try to focus on one particular thing only at a time to study it well. Then we come back and we pick out something else to study in relation to that, but focus only on that. Then understand how they relate to each other. And so we're going up and down this ladder of abstraction, become more abstract, back to concrete, pull in something more real from the world, back to the abstraction and so forth. And he signals doing this in the text all the time. So pay attention to that when you're reading. He's telling you what he's doing. Uh, magnetic induction will be inducing a current to flow and, and, uh, and, and we'll study that. And the last quasi-static approximation I have to talk about, uh, it's not so easy to summarize here, but we're building up, then finally, when we get to the Maxwell's equation, we'll let all approximations, all static approximations go. That is, we, we don't have to hold things still anymore. We can let things move. And then we'll have a full understanding of the electric and magnetic fields and their effects on charged bodies. Okay, now to get there, this chapter two, the electrostatics, is a very meaty chapter. Chapter two has a lot in it. And for various reasons. One of them is, uh, aside from the physical effects that we're studying, he's introducing a mathematics to describe fields. And the fields that we're studying are of two types. We have scalar fields and we have vector fields. So a field associates, a scalar field associates a number with every point in the room. And so it could be represented by a, a, a function of the coordinates. 
a vector field associates a vector with every point in the room. So there, at, there's some property of a plana that's represented by a vector. So it has a, a, an, an intensity or a magnitude and a direction associated with it. An example of that is a gravitational field. Um, so the gravitational force is an example of a vector field. We also had the potential energy, uh, and that would be at this location, if we were to put a body, massive body there, there would be associated with it a potential energy as well as a force. So the potential energy is a scalar field, and the force due to gravity is a vector field. So we're going to study now the mathematics of these fields, both scalar and vectors, and the vector fields especially are going to be challenging. We're going to develop a mathematics to describe vector fields. We're doing vector calculus in this chapter, so you're at the beginning of it. You're at the beginning of developing vector calculus. And this allows us to treat electric and magnetic fields in an imperiometric way. Okay, so the first thing I want to discuss then, if you've done in relation to this, this is all developing mathematics. And um, you're going to spend a lot of time in the homework for Wednesday dealing with these things. So the first thing I want to introduce to you is partial derivatives. You've done differentiation before where we have a function and we take its derivative and we get a new function, which we label f prime. Uh, and so this, uh, let's explain what this is. We've talked about this before. A function takes a number. A function is like a box, a machine, where we put in a number and we get out another number. So a function maps a number to a number. Uh, now we also have something where we, we put in a function and we get out another function, and that's called an operator. So it is an example of an operator. You put in a function, and you get out another function. So if I take the uh, derivative of x squared, for example, I get another function. So x squared is mapped onto 2x. Okay. Now we've also um, explored the antiderivative, we've done some homework related to that. So the antiderivative simply undoes the derivative. But the antiderivative involves always an arbitrary constant, which is not set by the requirement of the, of the antiderivative. So the antiderivative is also an operator, maps a function to another function. Actually, it maps a, into a family of functions, namely functions that are related by a constant shift. So all, and that's because if you have two functions that are simply related by a shift, then the derivative is the same everywhere. The slope is the same for all, for all values of x. And so the slope here and the slope here are the same. So that uh, shifting gives you a family of functions. So it maps a function onto a family of functions. Okay. Now you've studied these antiderivatives, so you're going to do some of these. But first I want to um, introduce the, the idea here of the partial derivative. Let's suppose we have a function of multiple variables. So, for example, uh, on this table here, I have I could measure the temperature at different locations on this table. And each point could be identified via the usual Cartesian coordinate system. I could identify a, a point there which is labeled by its x and y coordinates. And so I would have that function, the temperature is a function of where you are on the table, so it becomes a function of two variables. Or you could talk about the temperature of the air in this room. It's a function of three variables, x, y, and z. Let's take this uh, example of just two variables now. We could talk about a derivative. So we have uh, x and y. And at each point here, um, there is a function associated with that point. And I, I want to dis decide, I want to understand how it is that the function depends on the location. And so one way to do that is to take a neighboring point here at delta x, and I compare the function at those two points. Now, it obviously depends on the direction here, so I'm going along the x direction first. And I could say how much change is there in the function if I change x. And so I'm going to compare f at x plus delta x to itself at, uh, I'm sorry, this is y here. So I'm going to take the difference in that function if I go to take one, take a small step to the right on the x direction, and to divide that by delta x. Now that looks like a derivative, 
But because, and it is in fact a derivative, but because this function, let me erase that here. Hello. Okay. Uh, and this is a derivative with respect to x. And uh, so we'll take the usual limiting procedure, limit as delta x goes to zero, and we'll call that it's a derivative. But because this function has two variables, we're going to use a slightly different notation. And that is that funny looking the partial derivative symbol. So that's the partial derivative of f with respect to x, which is a function of two variables. You treat y as a constant. That's really all this means. It's a derivative. You're just treating y to be a constant. Uh, but you could do the same thing in y. So you could have a function, the der partial derivative of f with respect to the other variable. And so you can, you can imagine, you can picture in this case with a two-dimensional function, that there's a third direction, which is the, the value of the function itself. So imagine that you have the xy plane here, and the function of that gives you a surface. And each point here is mapped onto a, a point here. And you want to know how does that, what is the slope of that function with respect to one of the, either of these variables either in this direction or in this direction. Okay. All right, so that's a partial derivative. And it's really, it's really not hard because you learn how to take derivatives. You just hold one of the variables fixed while you take the difference with respect to another variable. So an example would be the deriv partial derivative with respect to x of x squared plus y squared. Uh, it's distributive. The partial derivative of x with respect, uh, partial derivative of x squared with respect to x, of course, is just 2x. And the partial derivative of any function of y with respect to x is 0, because y doesn't change if you change x. OK, so you're going to do some work on that. Now let's go back to the antiderivative anti here. And uh, so if I take any function, take its derivative, and then do the antiderivative of that, I get back to the function like that. So the antiderivative of a derivative gets you back to the original function. And likewise, the derivative of the antiderivative takes you back to the function again, plus a constant. This is an inverse operation. Oh, I'm sorry, no constant there. Excuse me, no constant there. Racers right here. Okay. Um, okay, now, also some notation here. If I have a vertical bar, wrong as this one. Doing what I want it to do. There we go. A vertical bar. So f of x with a vertical bar, say with an a at the bottom, that is uh, to evaluate f of x. At a, x equals to a. Um, then, if I have a vertical bar with two pieces here, a, a lower and an upper, that's a difference. That's a delta. What is the difference in f between two different places? Okay. Okay. Now, what he shows then there there is going to be here. Uh, if I have this antiderivative and I evaluate this between two places. This is going to be f of b plus c. That's the antiderivative of f prime minus f of a plus c. And the c drops out. And what I get is f of b minus f of a. And this is uh, getting really close to something important here. Uh, but this notation here with evaluating this antiderivative at two different locations like that is also written on the integral sign itself like this. Now the meaning of this hasn't been fully explored here, not yet. Uh, but this is called the fundamental theorem of calculus. But I've introduced here in a kind of 
subtle way without much warning a, a different thing. This is called a definite integral as compared to an indefinite integral. So an indefinite integral is an antiderivative. Whereas a definite integral is evaluates the indefinite integral at, at end points. But it's also turns out to be the area under the curve of that function. And the connection to that, if I, I can demonstrate here to you one simple way to do that. I, uh, you have some reading in the book uh, back in TFR Mechanics where we actually skipped over this last year, we did, last semester we didn't do this. Now you're going back to read it again. Uh, where he demonstrates that the definite integral, which is related to the indefinite integral in this way, uh, actually gives you the area under the curve. So in other words, the, in the integral this is the area under f of x between a and b, x equals a and x equals b. So in other words, what you get is if you have a function f of x between x equals a and x equals b, that uh, this area here is uh, given by evaluating the antiderivative of the function and evaluating it at the endpoints. That's kind of surprising connection, and you can you can demonstrate that in a multi, uh, many different ways. I'm going to give you one demonstration. Let's go back to this fundamental theorem of calculus. I want to take the derivative of this with respect to b, partial derivative. Right? What we have here on the left hand side is a function of a and b. It's a function of two variables, a and b. And I want to take the der partial derivative of this with respect to b. So in other words, I have the partial derivative of this integral with respect to b. Well, that, that is zero because it doesn't depend on b. So if I take the partial derivative of this thing, I get that, that that's equal to the derivative of the function evaluated at b up at that upper limit. So the dependence on the lower limit goes away when I take the derivative. Okay, so now let's look at what that means. This is it's a difference in two integrals divided by delta b. I'm going to change b slightly. And I'm going to evaluate that this is uh, the partial derivative with respect to b is this. And notice that I have evaluations at two different upper limits. The lower limit stays the same. And so if I think about that, that's actually equal to the difference. What is the additional difference here in, in this case? Because the delta b that this doesn't have, if I take the, the difference there, I see that that is just the... Uh, in def uh, the definite integral from b to b plus delta b. That's the difference in these two integrals. And, and you get that from remembering that we're just taking this symbol here uh, from a to b is a, is a delta. It's an evaluation between a and b. And if we take two deltas like this, the difference between the deltas is just that interval between b and b plus delta b. So when we divide by delta b. Okay, if we make delta b very small, this is going to be equal to, approximately equal to, the function of the integral evaluated, what's inside the integral evaluated at b. Because I'm uh, uh, capturing that uh, function in that very limited interval. Okay, so that shows you that there is in fact a relationship between the indefinite integral, the definite integral, and the area under the curve. That, that the integral, the antiderivative, evaluated at those two endpoints actually gives you the area under the curve, under the function. Okay, so in other words, the area between of uh, f of x evaluated between a and b is the integral, definite integral, f of x dx. So I first have to find the antiderivative of f of x and then I evaluate that, take the difference at the endpoints. And that gives you the area under the curve. Now this thing, this definite integral, is 
called a functional. So I have a function f of x, and the area depends on that function. It's a number. So I have a function into this functional, and it produces a number, which is the area. So it goes from function to number. So we mapped a number to a number. We mapped a, a function to a number. We mapped a function to a function. And they all have different names. Just a function is one, an operator is another, and a functional is the example of mapping a function to a number. Okay, so you're going to practice taking antiderivatives, in other words, integrals, and uh, both indefinite and definite integrals. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this uh, because you should be taking a course in this. What we're, we're going to re uh, basically memorize after you do these worksheets, basically memorize these. Uh, the other thing that, and the other thing that you will do in your homework here is to uh, demonstrate the connection between the area and the definite integral uh, by the following fashion. I could calculate the area under this curve by taking uh, breaking this up into finite steps, all of width, all of width delta x, and and approximate the area as a sum of the areas of these rectangles. I'm going from a to b, and so I can divide up the interval between a and b in some finite number of steps, and I can uh, add those all up, and then take the limit as delta x goes small, and so you start with a summation f of x in delta x, where x sub n is the nth uh, value of x here as I step from a to b. And that in the limit, as the number of these goes uh, unbounded, this is the integral of f of x, the, the definite integral of f of x from a to b. And we'll demonstrate that. You'll read that in the textbook. So you'll study that, and you'll do a couple of problems related to that. You'll demonstrate doing this that uh, the area under x from a to b then is one half uh, of b squared minus a squared, for example. You'll demonstrate that. And you'll also demonstrate that squared, what is it, uh, b cubed minus a cubed. You'll do these two by this approximation, by this. Break it down into pieces and calculate the area under the curve and take the limit as the number of intervals gets very large. Okay, so we will use these integrals uh, to do a number of different things. So I'm, I'm first I'm going to introduce now to you, do you have any questions so far of any of this? Okay. Um, you'll, we're, we're not going to do very many complicated integrals. The integrals, the functions are pretty simple. They're simple polynomials for the most part, some logarithms. Uh, and so you'll actually uh, be able to get along by memorizing a small number of integrals and derivatives and just using those. Okay. All right, now, related to the partial derivative, uh, we're going to define another operator called the gradient. It's written in two different ways. One is uh, upside down delta, Greek delta, inverted like that, uh, also called grad f. Um, and the great, this, or, or called gradient, also gradient. Full name is gradient. The gradient is a vector field. It takes a scalar field and produces a vector field as a result. And all vectors have both magnitude and direction. So the direction of the vector, the gradient, is uphill. Which, which way will take me up? meaning uphill in terms of the value of the function. Which way is, do I go to increase the value of the function? And the magnitude is its slope in that direction. So let's take an example. Now, there, there are also going to be things that you're going to learn how to do, how to sketch these functions. And let's do this in two dimensions. Let's suppose I take a simple example. It looks like this. Okay, now what I'm trying to do here, not doing it very well, is to draw lines that represent constant value of the function. So I have a function f of x and y, 
And uh, if I suppose I want to draw the curve in the xy plane where the function doesn't change its value. So uh, it could be, for example, on this table, I have the temperature plotted, I have the temperature measured everywhere on this table, and now I find that I could draw a line connecting all the points that had the same temperature. And that would be a closed line on this. You have, when you think about it for a while, you realize it has to be a closed line for most functions. Uh, the line can't simply end. It has to be a closed line for most functions. Okay, And uh, so those, those are ISO value curves, constant value of F. Uh, you could picture, for example, on a map, you might have the altitude. Um, for example, a topographic map shows these. You have uh, different altitudes above sea level. And if you think about it, that you could walk along a line. If you're near a hill, for example, near the, the top of the hill, you could walk a closed path staying always at the same altitude, and you'd come back to the same point where you started. Okay, and so that's what you're drawing here, these uh, 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 contours, contour lines. This is a contour plot or a contour map of the function, uh, scalar function here. Uh, okay, so the meaning of this, for example, this, this might be a hill. Uh, and that the center circle represents you're getting close to the top of the hill, and the hill falls away as you go away from that center point there, and so it's going downhill. It could also be, you can't tell from this map alone, unless you give the value of the, of the contour, the value of the function associated with each contour. Could be a, a valley, could be a minimum as well. You can't tell from this alone, unless you have the values of the contours. So let's suppose for a minute, let's consider this to be a bowl. This could be a, a minimum like this. Now, in what direction do I go uphill? So that is, I'm, I want to know what direction do I go so that the function is increasing. Well, if I'm right here at that value of x and y, what direction do I move? Remember, it's in a bowl. What direction do I move to go up in value of the function? Now, I'm moving in the xy plane. Don't get confused with a vertical component. You're wanting to know what direction I move in the xy plane to increase the value of the altitude or the temperature. So this could be a cold spot in the table. And the temperature increases around the cold spot. Maybe you've got a piece of ice below the table. It cools off this region. And I want to know what, what direction do I move to increase the temperature? Right. Yes, straight right. That would be the gradient, the direction of the gradient. And the magnitude, the, the magnitude of that vector will be the slope of the function. So the slope, how fast that function changes in that direction. Okay. So now if I get to the maximum here, the, the, oh, I'm sorry, the minimum, this was a bowl. If I get to the, to the bottom of the bowl, the slope is almost zero. In fact, if I'm right at the minimum, the, the gradient is zero. There is no direction in which I could move uh, because it's at a minimum. The slope is zero. Okay, so I could plot the gradient, sketch the gradient here from the contour plot. And this this implies that the slope is increasing the farther away you get from the minimum here, the way I'm drawing this, right? So that would be a map of the gradient. I've associated with every point a vector whose direction is the direction of increase in function, and the, and the magnitude is the slope of the function along that direction. So that's the primary definition of the gradient. Now, with vectors, remember, we wanted to be able to calculate things. It sounded often convenient to represent this in Cartesian form. And if you think about it for a minute here, for example, at, at, this, at, at any point here, for example, here, if I move just in the x direction, I get the partial derivative. The slope is the partial derivative in the x direction here. And in the y direction, it's the partial derivative with respect to y. So the Cartesian form of the gradient is, for this function of two variables, I should make this x and y, it has two Cartesian components. And the Cartesian components are the partial derivatives. I have a function of three dimensions. The gradient has 
the slope along each direction, which is the partial derivative. So that is the Cartesian form of the gradient. But I want you to start with, as always, when we were doing dot products and so forth, we always started with the fundamental definition here, that. That's what I want you to remember first as the gradients. But it may be convenient for doing calculations. If I have the function in, in of the Cartesian variables, I can calculate it that way. Now, we had uh, a relationship between um, uh, the force and the potential in one dimension. Remember, we said that for a conservative force, such as gravity or the, uh, excuse me just a second, that's my reminder here, I've got just five minutes. Um, Okay, so you remember for a conservative force, we could define a potential energy, which was a potentially kinetic energy, and we could apply then a conservation of total energy, which is the sum of kinetic and potential for the conservative force. Uh, so the uh, total energy is conserved if the forces are uh, all conservative. Or you could modify the conservation theorem that the amount of energy lost is the work done by dissipative forces. So let's assume that we don't have any dissipative forces and we're dealing only with conservative forces. And there should be a, a scalar function of position, which is the potential energy. It depends, in most cases, only on the position, not the time. Okay, and, and that's what we're going to consider is, uh, now. Simply a function of position. An example would be the potential energy due to gravity is simply linear in the height above the floor. So we said for these one-dimensional cases that we had this relationship between the force and the potential energy. And in fact, the potential uh, we can now write this, which is the application of the fundamental theorem of calculus. We can write that. We can calculate the difference in potential energy at two points by Calculating the work between, uh, so that indefinite, that definite integral is the work done by the force from moving from A to B. And so if we know the force, we can calculate the difference in potential energy. If we have the potential energy, we can calculate the force. And so you'll, you'll do that. Uh, so uh, correspondingly, for example, suppose there is no force, no net force on a body, then how will the potential energy look? be a constant. Suppose that there's a constant force acting on the body. For example, the, near the surface of the Earth, I have a, the force, gravitational force applied through the plana by the Earth on this is just proportional to the mass of this and it's downward and it's constant. So what is the potential energy in that case? Linear. It's going to be a linear function. Remember it was mgh, potential energy. Now notice that we picked the reference point in that. h is the height above the floor. Uh, and that's because ap applying the fundamental theorem of calculus here, we only get the difference in potential energies at two different places. Now, so we could pick a reference point and, and set the potential energy to be zero. Now, that's, that's a convenience. Uh, for the purposes of what we do here, we can pick the reference point uh, for convenience. Now, there might be a reason later to give an absolute magnitude to the potential energy not just deal with relative values, in which case we would be given by nature the point of reference uh, for some reason. But uh, in the applications that we're going to do here, we're going to ignore that possibility and just say that the potential energy is just arbitrary to within a constant. We can set the constant to such that the potential energy at some particular location is zero. And it's convenient to choose the floor. If I'm doing experiments here in the room, set the potential energy to be zero there and so the potential then is just mgh, height above the floor. Okay. Uh, gravity, then we have uh, the force goes like 1 over r squared, so the potential energy goes like the vec goes like uh, negative 1 over r squared. What will the potential energy go like? You got a lot of negative signs you got to keep track of, right? You got to go through here. It, it will go like negative 1 over r. You're going to do this 
in your homework. The point of reference here is the point at infinity, infinitely far away. So taking the limit now, moving the point of reference far away, the force there goes to zero very quickly. I'm going to use that as my point of reference usually for gravitational problems, is put that point of reference at infinity. So the potential energy is how much kinetic energy will be gained by starting with a body really far away and letting it fall in towards the sun or the earth. That will be the amount of kinetic energy it gains will be given by that difference in potential energy or the potential, en potential energy gained or the work done by the, related to the work done by the gravitational force. Okay, so you're going to work on that. Now the final thing and I, uh, is to consider that the potential energy is really a function of x, y, and z if I have a three-dimensional uh, force. So how would I calculate the force? If I know the potential energy, how do I calculate the force? In one dimension is the negative derivative of the potential energy. Now I have a function of possibly three variables. What would be the extension of the derivative into multiple dimensions? The derivative of each direction. Yeah, that's right. And the force would be associated with a change in the potential energy in that direction. Now there's going to be a negative sign. So what is the derivative in each direction? Yeah, the partial in each direction. And how do we change that in? How do we give it the, the Cartesian components of that? It's the gradient. It's the negative gradient, the mean of the, of the force. Negative gradient of the potential energy. I'm sorry, I said force. Didn't mean to say that. Still, I still can't get these erasers to work here. I'm still getting used to this. Here we go. Okay. 